here today to talk to you guys about jeans. And when I say jeans, I don't mean that. I don't mean the jeans you're wearing, but rather the jeans you're carrying, your DNA. So to start off, I thought we'd talk really quickly about some things you might have heard about your genes that you're wondering about. And first of all, you might have heard that you share 99% of them with chimpanzees, which are our closest living relative. And that is absolutely true. You might have also heard that there is less DNA in you, in each of your cells, than there is in those of a humble onion. And that is also true. And lastly, who amongst you hasn't heard on TV or read on Facebook or on any other sources that scientists have discovered the gene for things like crime or maybe autism or cancer or beauty or attraction or really any other number of traits? Well, I'm going to tell you something, and that something is that that is wrong, and I'm going to tell you why. So, These days, it's really, really fashionable to attribute all kinds of phenomenal powers to our DNA, to the degree that you might start to wonder if there is really any reason in trying to fight your genetic destiny. What makes you you and makes me me is, the argument goes, innate. It's something you're born with. It's your DNA. And you know, some of you might actually find that comforting, because if you're destined to gain weight no matter what, then you might as well enjoy yourself at lunch and stop feeling guilty about it, you know? Why try to fight this? Everybody knows you can't actually win against your DNA. But is that really true? You know, is your DNA really all that powerful? And this is a question you might have asked yourself before, and it's indeed a question you might have heard of before, because it has been referred to for a long time as the question of nature versus nurture. Okay? So, Sometimes it's very true that there is nothing you can do against your DNA. And let me give you a pretty sobering example, and it's that of Huntington's disease. It is a terrible, terrible disease, one in which the cells in your brain become damaged and slowly die, and so you irreparably lose your ability to control both your body and your mind. And there is a disease for which there is neither treatment nor cure. It is also a fully genetic disease. All it takes is a single damaged copy of a single gene. If you have that copy, you will get the disease. It is unavoidable. But not all diseases, and not all traits, in fact, behave like this. Just because one of your parents had cancer does not mean that you, too, necessarily will have cancer, even though you inherited half of your DNA from that parent. And the same is true, in fact, of many traits, traits like height and weight and even intelligence, and also of complex diseases, of things like diabetes or heart disease. For instance, you could be the child of the tallest two people on Earth, but if you were malnourished as an infant, it is extremely unlikely that you will be as tall as they are. So sometimes your life experiences trump your genes. Nice and easy. Sometimes nurture wins. And in fact, if you look back 50 years, 100 years ago, you'll find that most philosophers strongly denied that nature had any role in shaping humans. The only thing that mattered was nurture. The only thing that mattered was experience. Nothing about humans was innate. Now, both of those positions are actually rather extreme. If you stop to think about it for a second, you'll realize that sometimes when nature and nurture, when DNA and experience fight, the winner is really easy to predict. For instance, you can wish all you want for six fingers. If you were not born with six fingers, you will never have them. I'm really sorry to disappoint you. On the other hand, just because you cannot speak German today, there is nothing in your DNA at all that says that you cannot learn it if you start studying it tomorrow. So, yes, sometimes the questions can, are easy to answer. Sometimes those are simple answers. But simple answers, are, although they are really, really tempting, are most of the time not right. And in fact, complex problems are far more common and, to me, far more interesting than simple ones. So I want to tell you a story about my doctoral work. So when I was a graduate student, I'm a human evolutionary geneticist, and what that means is like, that I'm really interested in understanding what bits of our DNA make us human and, that it, and how they do so. And when I was a graduate student, I focused on this bit of DNA here. And why this one? Well, it's clearly not very obvious from the sequence. And in fact, the reason is something you might not expect at all, because the reason is milk. That's right, milk. So 
Milk is a really complex substance. It contains all kinds of things. But the one I'm really interested in is this molecule here called lactose. Lactose is a sugar, just like the glucose that your doctor tells you and your parents and your grandparents to keep an eye out so you don't get diabetes, or like the fructose that makes fruits taste sweet. But lactose is found almost exclusively in milk. When you drink milk, it makes its way down your gut into your stomach, where your body recognizes it, breaks it down, and uses it to make energy to fuel itself. And you might remember from school that all mammals, from seals to pigs to lions, they all make milk to feed their babies. And in fact, baby sheep, baby gorillas, baby sea otters, they all rely on their mothers to nourish them with milk at the beginning of life. But something happens to all of these adorable animals when they grow up, and, they, and that is that they lose the ability to digest lactose. They can no longer break it down, even kittens. So you can feed an adorable kitten a saucer of milk. He will, of course, drink it and lap it up, and he will be the happiest kitten you've ever seen, probably. But if you feed a grown cat a saucer of milk, he might drink it. Yes, in fact, I can tell you they will drink it. But believe me when I tell you, they are not digesting that lactose. They are not breaking it down. I have cats at home, so again, believe me when I tell you that I have seen and I have smelled and I have cleaned up proof of the fact that they are not digesting the lactose. <laughs> the only exception to this is some, but this is extremely important, not all humans. So, I am not a child, I hope you will all agree, although I can nonetheless digest lactose very comfortably. But because we are in Singapore, I feel really comfortable saying that the vast majority of you in this audience could not go home right now, drink a pint of milk, and not feel terrible for a while. That said, if you don't believe me, if you haven't done this experiment, please, by all means, do it. But don't just drink, oh, you know, a little sip of milk, or oh, a little pot of yogurt. No, 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 no. I want you to go home and pour yourself a nice tall glass of just plain cold milk, nice and full of lactose. And my guess is that you're all going to end up pretty annoyed at me for having talked you into doing that. But, you know, how do I know this? I mean, my job is not actually to go around and ask animals how much they like milk, and I don't know any of you, so I really don't know if you like milk. But how, so how am I so comfortable in my guess? Well, the answer is really simple. It's that bit of DNA that I showed you. In fact, it's that little C, the one in red there. That is something that I have that most of you don't, and that's because it's found primarily in people of European descent. You can see here in this map, which I took from some colleagues, Yuvani Tal and his friends, where that little C is most common in, in places like Britain and Northern Europe, and where it is least common in the world, which is pretty much anywhere in blue. You can also see that it's pretty much unseen east of India, which is the region I studied as a PhD student. That single C, that tiny little change, gives me the ability to digest lactose as an adult. So, on the surface, that would seem like a really clear case for, lactose, for DNA winning everything, for DNA beating nurture again, right? I mean, a single difference, and I can do something you cannot. You have the, so I have the mutation, I can digest lactose. You don't have it, you feel sick. Case closed, right? I mean, clearly. But actually, let's take a step back because there is one thing missing from this story. That's the milk. Where does the milk come from, you know? That bit is certainly not encoded by that little C. So the truth is, yes, I have a mutation in my DNA that lets me digest lactose. If I don't have access to cows, or to goats, or to sheep, or to camels, or to any other animal we can milk, that mutation is totally pointless. Being able to digest milk is a totally pointless ability if you have no access to milk. So maybe DNA is actually not that mighty. And let me give you another example. This one is a bit more somber, but I think you'll see what, I'm, what I mean. So here on this figure, you can see on this graph, you can see how common it was for American men to die of different types of cancer at different times in the 20th century. And I took this from a study from the Cleveland Clinic in the US, so the stats are for US men. As you can see, most of the 20th century, the most common form of cancer has been lung cancer, which is the one that I'm pointing to with the big red arrow over there, right? 
Now, cancer is a disease that is caused fundamentally by damage to your DNA that damages your body's abilities to control when and where your cells divide. So in a sense, cancer is caused by your DNA. So here we are again, DNA, genetic destiny. But actually, is that really true? Because we all know that there is a reason cancer has become so common in the past 50, 60, 70 years, and it's got nothing at all to do with DNA. What I'm talking about, of course, is the rise of smoking. In fact, if you look at the figure, you'll see that lung cancer was pretty uncommon in the US until cigarettes became widespread. And while not everybody who smokes will get lung cancer, and not everybody who gets lung cancer is a smoker, the fact remains that smoking dramatically damages the cells in your lungs, and that in turn dramatically increases your chances of getting cancer. So then, what causes lung cancer? Is it nature? Is it DNA? I mean, if we damage DNA, we get cancer. Maybe it's actually nurture. I mean, without smoking, without damage to your genes, there is no cancer. So if you don't smoke, you don't damage your genes, you don't get cancer. So perhaps you see, though, where I'm going with this, because my question to you today is actually, well, does this really have to be a fight? Do we really need to think of this as nature versus nurture, nature or nurture? I think it's really, really clear that actually it's nature and nurture. Because the truth is that, yes, you have genes, we all have genes, and these genes do all kinds of things, right? But if you look at a single gene, what it tends to do tends to be pretty small. A single gene might do something like make a protein that breaks down lactose. And in isolation, that's not really striking, you might say to yourself. That's a fair criticism. But the beauty of the system is that genes respond to each other. A gene can react to the product of another gene. But even more striking is the fact that genes not only respond to each other, they respond to other things as well. They respond to the environment in which you live. They respond to the food you eat. They respond to the decisions you make. While it's really, really tempting to have a simple answer, to have some yes or no, nature or nurture, you might also even want someone to blame in some situations. The truth is, life is quite messy. That's not how life works. Life is really complicated. So the next time you see, science, you see a newspaper headline that says, oh, scientists have discovered the gene for cancer again, please keep in mind that what that article really means is that scientists have discovered a gene for cancer that is associated perhaps with higher likelihood or even less likelihood of getting cancer in a given environment. Because the truth is, there is no single gene for cancer. There are many genes, always many genes, that control, yes, your likelihood of getting cancer, but also things like your height, your weight, the shape of your face, the color of your skin, even the likelihood of you suffering from major depression at some point in your life. Okay? But without the wrong environment, likelihood and chances is all they will ever be. And so I want to leave you with this final thought. Despite what you might have heard before, you are not the battleground upon which nature and nurture fight. No, 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 absolutely not. You are the canvas upon which they collaborate. You are the product of their interactions. <laughs>